So, so that's just three tenths of a degree below where the Earth has spent most of its time during the last two billion years. Hothouse conditions. And getting there at least three orders of magnitude faster than any global average rise in temperature at any time in the past. Habitat is going away already. And we're just getting started. I can't imagine there will be a tree on the planet at 4C above baseline. Much less at 8 point whatever that was. Next. <laughs> so I think we missed the arc on this one. I think even if we start right now, it's still too late. At some point it's too late. At some point you can't start right now because you missed that train 25 years ago. I am not proposing, nor have I ever proposed, inaction in response to this information. I am telling you you're going to die. You knew that since you were 11. I'm telling you our species will go extinct. Every species does. I'm telling you that the universe was not all about us. It was not designed specifically for us. And here's a clue about why that may be the case. The universe has been here for 13.8 billion years. That's billion with a B. 13.8 billion years. Homo sapiens have been here 200,000 years. If the universe is all about us, if the whole show was designed just for our magnificence to arrive and exhibit, the universe has been very damned patient. 13.8 billion years the universe waited for us to show up. How disappointing. <laughs> I am not proposing inaction. As Edward Abbey pointed out many years ago, sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. Hope is wishful thinking. What better judge of our character than, we, than how we act in the light of impossible odds? I don't think there will be habitat on this planet for humans long before we get to the 10 year mark. So people say, so what do you want me to do? Maybe we can continue to blow up the laboratory and survive like a 12-year-old. Maybe we can continue to shit in our own nest indefinitely and turn that into soylent green or brown or whatever that would be and persist forever. Maybe humans are just so awesome that we'll figure out a way to destroy the entire living planet and we'll be fine. I mean, we'll be missing our eyebrows, but other than that, we'll be fine. I don't think so, but I haven't even gone extinct yet, much less the whole species. So we don't really know, do we? What I recommend for almost everybody is, if you don't have long, maybe you should pursue two things. Excellence in whatever it is you're doing. And love, why would you not? Life is short. Life is very, very short. I don't know how you do that, but one of the ways is maybe to be fully present with where you're at and who you're with. So this is, this is me, right, walking into the park and thinking about standing up on a podium with my notes and, and the woman with the purse who's in my life is pissed off and I don't know what the sperm here is doing there. I don't know how that came from. And the computer monitor is tipped over and the computer's broken and I'm thinking about my mismatched socks and there's this song running through my head all the time. There's people out there watching me behind the podium and they're mad and they have bills to pay and all these things are going on in my head. And the dog is like, whoo, happy day. The dog sees four trees and the sun. The person doesn't see any of that. The person sees all the things that he has to worry about. Don't let this be you. This is who you want to be. Create. In, in, in all of my science classes at the university the last, I don't know, decade or so I was there, I had students complete a major piece of art or literature. These are in science classes. This is why I wasn't allowed to teach for a while. A major piece of art or literature is a significant part of their grade. Everybody had to create art. And my students, uh, I started this in a class called Conservation Biology. 
There were 37 students. It was, it was not a required class for any student on campus. So they came from 24 different majors. So there was, there was creative writing majors, and there was biology majors, like you might expect, and there were artists, there were all kinds of freaks there. Oh, a loud voice. And, and every day for 15 weeks in that class and every other class I taught, every day for 15 weeks students complained about having to, to create something some significant piece of art or literature in a science class. They hated me, and they went to the department head, and they complained, and they wrote letters, and I was the most horrible person on the planet. And then the last, the last class period of the semester, we all got together, and we shared with each other what we had created. And every student walked out and said, we should have to do this in every class. This is the most important thing I've ever done in college. Why doesn't everybody do this? Well, maybe because you went to the dean last week and told him I was an asshole. Maybe that has something to do with it. Did you ever think, well, oh, but I didn't mean that now. Yes, I'm all about integration. All about integration. You know, from Francis Bacon to Socrates to the two cultures of C.P. Snow to Consilience by Edward O. Wilson. Integration of knowledge from the arts and the natural sciences has been pivotal to interpersonal development. It has not been pivotal to imperialism. It has not been pivotal to the development of civilization. For those things, we need separation. We need non-integration. We need specialization. We need jobs. They require you to do this. For eight hours a day, five days a week, until you can no longer move your wrist without a band. It already hurts. Some people, they do that all day, every day. That's what civilization is. That's what it requires. Before civilization, and, and, and there are still people who live outside of civilization, and those people do many things, and they're good at many things, and they do them with other people, and they don't they don't do work like we think of work. They, they work, they exert themselves for maybe 10 or 15 hours a week to secure their food and water and maintain their body temperature. And then they get the whole rest of the week to play and create. Mostly create babies, but that's just an aside. They're creating other things too. Within civilization, at some point, somebody convinced us that instead of having fun all the time and, and the society being non-hierarchical and everybody living in the natural world and appreciating that, somebody came along and says, hey, I got a 1967 Dodge. No, no, that wasn't exactly. I got this deal. I'm going to take all those things that you're really good at and that you love doing and take all your spare time and have you do this for 40 hours a week and in exchange, you're going to get food and water and a place to live. And we went for it. We're like, yeah, where do I sign up for that? That sounds great. I can do this all day. It doesn't look very hard. I'm starting to think we're stupid. <laughs> or that was a really good salesman. Or woman. We don't know. It occurs to me that Buddhism has anticipated your thesis and has really prepared the way to how to deal with this in the, in the most uh, profound way you could. I absolutely agree that Buddhism, the philosophy, if not the religion, offers a way forward with numerous principles, including living with compassion, and living peacefully, and taking right action, even if the outcomes are unknown, even if those actions don't lead to an improved situation, because we can't know. As Buddhism points out, hope and fear are the twin sides of the I can't predict the future coin, right? They're both four-letter words, I should note and one of them presumes to know the future and anticipates it eagerly. 
That's hope. The other is fear. It presumes to know the future and assumes that it's going to be bad. Let's instead live here now, act compassionately with those we're with, and not assume that we can influence, that we can have great influence over the future. I would like to know uh, your perspective regarding the, uh, the culture of bargaining. Uh, the Prius driving ardent recyclers who uh, believe that with their good doing, their organic vegetable buying, their GMO labeling, that this somehow is going to make them better or longer living or somehow it's going to save the planet if they plant a tree somehow. Uh, I know that in the past you've talked about bargaining. Or if you have. I, I get the distinct impression that you have a take that you're not quite willing to reveal. It's not about me, it's about you. Ah. That's the kind of question I can get into. Bargaining is what I'm talking about, our bargaining. You know, I, I hear almost always when I talk about abrupt climate change, there is a vegan who says we can fix it. If we, go, if we all go vegan right now, we can fix it. Well. Veganism requires civilization. It pretty much depends heavily on the growing of grains to support 7.4 billion vegans. Would be quite a trick. Or there's, you know, there's about 20 other single issue types. If we just got rid of Republicans, <laughs> by which I think they mean Democrats and Republicans, the twin chiefs of the corporate ass. <laughs> If we just all vote Green Party, if we all go electric cars, if we all start walking, if we all go public transportation, if we all go organic, if we all go GMO, you know, I think those things are all great. I think they fall under the category of right action, depending upon your philosophy of life. I am not vegan. I am not even vegetarian, although mostly I am. But when, when you travel the way I do, by living at somebody else's house, you generally tend to eat what gets put in front of you, if anything at all. And you just hope for Twinkies and ice cream. Hint, hint. So uh, I think that, that many of these fall under the category of right action. Okay, I drive a Prius. I, I should rephrase that. I used to drive a Prius. Now I don't drive anything at all. I live in an off-grid house that's built out of straw bales and is passive solar heated. And I just assumed when I left active service at the university that, that, it, that people would look at me, the 49-year-old heterosexual white man who's a teacher, and he does these things and they would just all go along. <laughs> oh, that must be the right thing to do. Look, he's a college professor. So I'm going to do that too. As it turns out, not one single person did that so far. So, right action, I'm a huge fan. And, and also, um, not assuming that it will work out. And I'm exhibit A, because I took what I thought was right action and uh, the outcome did not please me. And so, I think that we almost always know what is right, given the circumstances. We almost always know what is right. And we think about the outcomes before making the decision. And I'm suggesting that we not think about the outcomes, that we not think we're going to have a particular outcome when we do what we believe is the right thing, even if it's veganism. Is it possible to incentivize and how we should just do it and uh, this idea of um, choosing the right way? Oh, is it possible to incentivize right action? Yes. Holy cow, yes there is. In, in societies of fewer than about 150 people, maybe 200 people, that's Dunbar's number, it seems that right action was incentivized this is before money. Because if you know everybody, there's currently an intentional community 
There's, there's a bunch of intentional communities. There's thousands of them. But there's one in Tucson, Arizona that I'm very familiar with. And they have 103 to 110 members. And so that's a small enough number of people that everybody knows everybody else. And you live with them. And if somebody is, is acting in a way that is not consistent with compassion and generosity and fairness to the other people in the community, everybody knows right away. You, there's no free riders in that system. So in that intentional community, there's this guy, one of my former students lives there, and there was this guy, I don't remember his name, we'll say it's Paul, and Paul was acting up, so the community got together and we said, we're going to have a meeting about Paul, and somebody went and told Paul, Paul, we're having a meeting, it's about you, you can't go. Here's what we're going to talk about. You're being an asshole on fronts A, B, C, and D, and we're going to talk about what we're going to do about that. Complete and total honesty. Because you live with 105 people. You can't do it any other way. That's the way to incentivize. In, in tribal societies, in pre-civilized communities, and in contemporary societies that act outside of civilization, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get banned. Because you can't survive on your own. We think we're all so independent and surviving on our own. Yeah, right, turn off the lights for a week. But in pre-civilized societies, they know that you can't persist on your own. You actually need other human beings for your own survival. So do we. So we need to act like it. And I think that the only way I know of to incentivize it is to force people to live in those kinds of com communities. And I don't think that's legal now. <laughs> if we hadn't uh, started using fossil fuels, where do you think our temperature would be right now? Uh. Ooh, that's a good question. If we had, if we had not gone with fossil fuels, I think we'd probably still be at thirteen and a half degrees global average temperature, which is where we were in seventeen fifty when we really started using fossil fuels at scale. I suspect that's right, but civilization, even civilizations that predated the industrial revolution, were creating greenhouse gases at a faster rate than you would expect. Because turning soil over releases methane and carbon dioxide. So that's a, that's a <laughs> geoengineering project of its own. So once we started farming, maybe the whole deal was locked in. We don't know. Okay. But I, I suspect we wouldn't be at 15. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I missed your whole talk, but I wanted to ask you. Um, you I, I heard my You're the guy who comes in. I know. But, and, um, and, and I say, it's okay. It's not like it's the end of the world. But my, oh, wait. <laughs> my, uh, my friend said that you uh, see us uh, pretty much ending in the next 10 years. Is that right? Okay. I can't imagine a situation in which there will be a human being on the planet in 10 years. Okay. And so do our global governments kind of know this and already? Or they're just like, and Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, like, man, take your pick and... Uh, anyways and then um, are they doing anything to combat it like uh, the conspiracy of chemtrails and like injecting shit into the atmosphere and stuff like that so is uh, geoengineering really going on and stuff like that you got a lot to say for a guy who came in late <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine the, the people pulling the strings of empire don't know what I know I mean it's all in the public domain these are referee journal articles these are very conservative sources that we're talking about, and there's Coast tremendous. Radio. Right. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, what are they doing? Well, as Tim Garrett's work pointed out, only collapse of civilization prevents runaway climate change. I don't think any government official is pro proposing terminating civilization because they would be tarred and feathered if they did. That would pretty much ruin their election chances. I can see the debate between Hillary and Trump, and, and one of them saying, well, I can terminate civilization within a month after I'm elected. And Trump saying, well, I can do two weeks. I can do a week. No, that's not going to happen. The, the civilization is something that's set of living arrangements that we don't even talk about. We just take for granted. But they know. You think they don't know? Of course they know what I know. And a whole lot more. 
So, what are they doing about it? I don't know. But whatever it is they're doing, it's almost certainly making things worse. I, I was interviewed at Cabo right before I came over here, and, and, and I was asked something like, what should we do, or should we do geoengineering, or should we not, should we do this, or should we do that? And I think, first, we should do no harm. We should stop doing whatever it is we think we're doing, because whatever it is we're doing is making things worse. Civilization is a heat engine. It's heating the planet. Let's stop. I love you people. And you didn't even see the real PowerPoint. <laughs> I just want to give you my profound thanks and to say that I am truly moved and that I intend to respond to the message. I think uh, we can predict that what will happen is that the people with power and influence and money will deal with this information by trying to protect their stake, trying to keep the, the gains that they have made and to make the rest of us pay for them. And I think the only response to this is to think about what kind of transition can we make? What kind of adaptation can we make? And we must think about making it just, and that means we have to make sacrifice. And I think that, uh, for me, is your message. Thank you for that synopsis. Obviously, during the course of Earth history, uh, those prior periods of, of high temperature did not result in the elimination of life forms. Um, they have persisted and returned in various forms. Uh, what do we anticipate in terms of uh, locations on the planet where the human species might survive? Yeah, that's a great question, and it brings up something I forgot in my presentation. I forgot to point out that in the wake of mass extinction events, as Gerardo Ceballos pointed out in his quote, it takes many millions of years to recover. He said it will take many millions of years to recover, and our species itself would likely disappear early on. And that's because we're a complex multicellular organism. What survives mass extinction events, such as the Great Dying 252 million years ago, what survives is the small things. It's a small world, after all. So work with me. So bacteria, microbes, small things tend to survive better than large things. And especially large things that depend upon many other small things to survive. So I suspect there will be habitat for humans and other large mammals as far south in the southern hemisphere as you can get, and there's still soil. And so I'm thinking everywhere outside of Antarctica. So Tasmania, the southern island state of Australia, where, where Steve Wozniak moved, and he told me this in light of my message. Where uh, New Zealand, where James Cameron has bought a tremendous amount of land. He, he's, he's not just filming movies there. Southern South America, Chile, Argentina, Southern Africa, like South Africa. These are the places that are far south, and, and there's multiple advantages there. They're close to the big body of water, the big body of ice that is not going away within the next few years, Antarctica. They're also surrounded by water, and water has a tremendous mediating impact on land temperatures. The interior of large continents heats up at least twice as fast as the global average, which is why it becomes so difficult to grow grains and therefore support civilization through stored food. It's because the grains are grown almost exclusively in the interior of large continents, mostly in the northern hemisphere. Well, the interior heats up at least twice as fast as the global average, so we're at 1.4 conservatively now, so we're at 2.8 at least, we'll say three degrees Celsius above baseline in the interior. It's very, very challenging to grow grains already. So, 
Move south, young man. My recommendation to people when they ask me where to move is to go here. To go into your heart. To go inside yourself. To think about what it means to be human at the most amazing time in human history. The end. Everybody else left this movie early. We get to be here for the best show on earth. It'll be so exciting. I suspect we will see people act so badly in so many ways it will make the current set of living conditions look downright ideal. I suspect we will see people acting so compassionately, so kindly, better than we've ever imagined. I suspect we'll see all of that and that it will be horrible and beautiful. On the plus side, it won't last long. <laughs>